With the release of OP7 500 years into the future, there are now a total of 67 different leaders to choose from. It can really be a lot to deal with. That's where this video comes into play. In order to help you choose a deck or get a feel for the game, I'll be going over what each of the different colors do, the overall meta for the current format, some new player picks, and lastly I'll show some decks that I personally would recommend. Everything will have a deck list, links are in the description. We'll also be going over average deck prices, so we can explain what it'll cost to play as well. Let's get started with an explanation and breakdown of the One Piece color pie. There are six different colors in the One Piece card game. Red is the color of aggression. This means low cost units and manipulating the power of an opponent's cards. A lot of decks in red focus on rushing down the opponent, such as Zoro, Monkey D Dragon, and Bellu Betty. This color is solid all around, but it isn't too impactful in the meta right now, outside of Trafalgar Law, who uses red's aggro options to beat down opponents. Green is the color of board manipulation. This means either spamming units or controlling an opponent's units by resting them. The color also does have some really unique things, such as having reusable searchers, restanding leaders, and having some amazing late game options. But this color is competitively very weak outside of Bonnie. It is one of the cheaper colors. Blue is the value color meaning absurd draw power and the best removal in the game. The downside is, you don't usually have the best board presence, but man, you get cards practically for free. Blue is best as a support color, and has struggled in the meta as kind of a result of this, but it really is strong in decks that rely on something else to lead. There are a lot of solid rogue options. Blue might just be the cheapest color. Purple is the color of ramp and dom manipulation. A ton of this color's decks focus on getting to late game early and then spamming out crazy top end cards. Since this color uses dawn as a cost, it gets some absurdly powerful effects as well. And if you build your deck right, you can turn that cost into a plus. While mostly having rogue strategies to choose from, purple does form one half of the best deck in the game. The best two colors in the game are yellow and black right now. Yellow does two things that are absurdly strong. First, the deck messes with life, primarily through healing, but it also does just do free damage as well. Second, the color abuses trigger units, which means turning your life into a slot machine and punishing your opponent for playing the game. Mix these factors together with some push game design, and you've got a competitive force. Black, on the other hand, does one thing really well, and that's removal. If you're playing a black deck, expect to be constantly removing your opponent's cards while still developing a board. You've also got the only graveyard recursion in the game, making for what's probably the best color overall at this time. It also helps that all the best counters for black are in black. Black and yellow also happen to be the most expensive colors, both needing some absurd staples across almost every set in the game. So, now that we have a breakdown of the general color pie, what leaders are actually good? Here's my breakdown of the overall state of every leader or deck in the game. This is a very rough and a very zoomed out breakdown of what's what. Any deck in the strong category is what's most likely to be seen at competitive tournament events. From this, the decks are then split into meta and rogue categories depending on how well they tend to do in those tournaments. If you're interested in only competitive play, I strongly recommend choosing one of the meta decks. Playable decks are any decks that could win a locals or potentially more if the player is good or creative enough. Weak decks are decks that struggle against basically everything or oftentimes are just worse versions of other decks. Even if the deck you're interested in isn't strong, don't get too discouraged. Just about every deck has something special it can do, and a good player can really bring out that spice. Some are just going to take way more work than others. Now that I've got your hopes up, let's crush them by doing a breakdown of this game's prices, so we can be realistic about what you can build. Let's start with the cheaper colors, green and red. Red is very cheap as long as you're not building Trafalgar Law, and Whitebeard staples are useful in other decks later on. Expect to build most red decks for about $100. Green decks tend to also mostly be cheaper, only having one or two top end cards be expensive. Luckily, with the way most green decks work, you pick only one or two of these in pieces and build around them. So, it's like an either or situation. An example, Uda builds around Captain Kid, and Wano builds more around Zoro and Hody Jones. And this holds true, unless you're Bonnie, where you just oftentimes kind of run them all. Expect most green decks to run you about $100 to $150, depending on your list. Purple is a more mixed bag, and is oftentimes way more expensive than it ought to be, with its two most generic staples of Queen and Bon Clay being quite pricey. Not every purple deck runs these, but all the strong ones do. 
Purple decks often tend to end up more around $100 to $200, depending on what staples your deck uses. You can cut quite a lot and get cheaper, but it gives mixed results. The two most expensive colors are yellow and black. Yellow requires expensive top end that just adds up, and black requires expensive engine pieces that also add up, and both are kind of hard required for their respective decks. Expect to spend above $200 for a black or yellow deck. Lastly, we have the cheapest color in the game, blue. Most everything is below $5. You have like one $10 top end card. Expect to build most blue decks for a bit below $100. So now that I've explained the general categories, let's go into specific deck explanations, starting with the five meta decks this format. These are the tournament heavy hitters that are expected to make it to the final rounds of 500 plus player events. Do note that these decks are not equal in power level. There's a lot going on and it's very hard to tell and predict which deck is gonna take the top spot at any given time. Although if I had to choose, I'd say that Trafalgar Law and Rob Lucci are the most popular and probably the best decks here. Red Purple Trafalgar Law is the best deck in the game by a decent margin. The leader skill enables both easy consistent removal while still throwing out a board. It's an efficiency monster. The deck creates this game design problem where every four cost or lower unit accidentally becomes insane support for this deck. So this leader's power level will only grow as time goes on. As such, there's a very real possibility that this leader will get banned in the future. It's already tier zero in the Japanese meta, which is about one set ahead of us. For now though, this deck has a few sections. First, there are cards dedicated to ramping. Even in other builds, about one third of this deck is dedicated to this. Second, we have the power decreasing options. These let the deck remove a 6k unit easily. Then we have draw power with queens and reiju. Really, this deck just has everything you need. Luckily, there's a lot of flex space and tons of room to experiment with different builds. So this is an immensely fun deck to mess around with. Plus, it's really good. The downside being that this deck is very expensive, averaging around $300. If you wanna be as competitive as possible, this is a recommended deck, but for newer players, I would say to avoid it. Black Yellow Luffy is a combo deck. Once its life is set to zero, Luffy will fill his life, then use baby versions of the three brothers to play units for free and set Luffy's base power to 9K. The deck then uses Gecko and Moria to do it again and again. I really like this deck a lot, and it has options for everything. It's got removal, draw power, rush, and high numbers. The trade-off is, it takes a good player to understand how to set up for this. This deck gets in the fun mind games, where opponents will try to stall out your life. So you have to use the optimal number of 2Ks, life take Luffy, or baiting to get to zero and go full combo without just losing. It's quite fun if you know what you're doing. In fact, it's technically my competitive deck of choice this format. Although I do honestly spend most of my time playing garbage, which we'll be discussing later. I can't really recommend this deck to new players since it's a bit too expensive and a bit too complicated. You need Sabos, Hiyoris, and Geckos, which is really rough. That being said, if you do want to play an OP13 starter deck leader cheaply, I recommend Sabo and Ace. Enel is a toxic late game stall leader. Enel works by healing you the first time your life hits zero each turn meaning at one life, it takes three swings minimum to beat this deck. As such, Enel gets to take its time playing for the late game, where it can get advantage with monolithic top end that gets value and heals at the same time. Enel also gets to go down to one life for free, enabling a rapid building of hand size, as well as being able to use options like Frankie, Rocket Luffy, and of course, Kingdom Come. There are two main builds of Enel. There's an aggressive Enel, and there's a control build using more defensive and late game cards. My build shown here leans towards control, which I do think is better. But do know that both builds have seen competitive success. Enel is very expensive, wanting to run eight expensive secret rares and some miscellaneous expensive yellow staples. This deck is really good, but honestly, I'm not a fan of it, so I don't recommend it unless you really, really like the more toxic elements of yellow. Bonnie is a stall grind leader, more so than Enel, honestly. Your leader skill halves the speed an opponent gets to play the game at by resting one anything every turn. As such, you're okay with playing honestly worse units for most of the game until you drop an absurd array of powerful top end specifically tailored to counter any situation. Bonnie has several builds, but the two main ones are a five cost synergy build with Don Quixote Rosinante and the build shown here with a full Don Quixote package. I prefer this build 
because I think the Double Searcher package has a better potential to grind. But like a lot of decks this format, multiple builds have seen success. This leader is great if you like grinding, and you're okay with buying the entirety of green's expensive top end options. This isn't my opinion of fun, but I do know a lot of people who really love this deck. Gecko Moria is a graveyard control and value deck. Your leader is able to pull a variety of solid options from the graveyard incredibly efficiently. It's got removal, recursion, hand discarding, and just easy value. Combine this with Black's naturally insane removal options, and you have a consistent powerhouse. Plus you get options to almost anything in your deck with 8-drop Gecko Moria, who is searchable with this leader. This is a deck that's super easy to pick up, yet still has a very high skill ceiling. Spoilers, but this deck also makes it to my list of new player picks. It's a bit more expensive and eating black staples, but as a more competitive recommendation, players looking to play the game more seriously, I really do think this is it. Going forward, it builds into other black decks, if you want to change it up, or it's still a solid competitive option if you really want to learn it. Gecko Moria is cool, but what if you want even more removal? Well, that's where Rob Lucci comes in. Get ready to remove your opponent's board by vaguely looking in their direction. This is possible because Rob Lucci does two things as a leader. It gives cost decrease through leader skill and in its lobby stage, and then mills for setup. Because, of course, this deck also gets to play units from trash. There is really only one build, and that's removal. Text and ratios change from build to build, but the general goal and playstyle remains the same. Rob Lucci is probably the second best deck in the game, and it's also still expensive like the other black decks. That being said, this is also a great deck to pick up if you like competitive. It might receive a card ban, but the leader and deck itself will still likely be fine long term. So, here are my new player recommendations. These decks were chosen for a few reasons. First, these decks should have gameplay welcoming to a new player. Second, these decks should be relatively affordable. Third, these decks should have long term playability, either on their own or by building into another deck. These aren't hard reasons, but more so general guidelines. Edward Newgate is very simple. He's a 6k base leader with 6 life. Even without the rest of the deck, he's got built in offense, defense, and a lot of hand size. With the rest of the deck, he has crazy rush options, powerful removal, units with protection, and a lot of defensive options. This leader naturally puts an opponent on a clock and will just win if an opponent can't break through its defenses. The issue comes from newer decks also being efficient and being able to establish enough of a board to power through this deck's strategy. Whitebeard mostly being a set 2 deck really does start to show. Good news is, this deck gets a new leader with Marco in set 8, who gives the deck access to some very solid blue support. And Whitebeard himself is getting a new starter deck with some really good options. So Whitebeard is a solid deck now that keeps getting relevant options going into the future. The gameplay is straightforward and fun, making it an ideal recommendation for a new player. Plus, it's cheap, being obtainable for less than $100, and even less than $60, depending on how prices fluctuate. Boa Hancock is just the ultimate blue leader. That means you get value. This leader gets to consistently draw extra cards every turn. In fact, it's not uncommon for Boa players to pointlessly guard with cards to cycle their hand. Finding that perfect removal for every situation is just very strong and it can win quite a few games. The Warlord engine is also quite good. However, the downsides of blue are still there. The board pressure just isn't enough in a lot of matchups. And because of that, the best decks can just remove anything this deck throws out. That being said, if you like blue, this is your best option until Doflamingo gets his new support. If you like Boa, you can get on this deck's hype train. Katakuri is a yellow trigger aggro deck with a top end that just wins games. By having around 70% of the deck being triggers, you get to punish the opponent for just trying to progress the game. Then late game, you throw out big moms, which are very toxic and hard to deal with. This deck's events make finishing games very easy, and Katakuri Leader makes for easy 7k swings. Katakuri is a very strong deck that really almost plays itself, making it perfect for new players. Katakuri is an older meta deck, meaning other decks have finally caught up with this deck's playstyle. Large top end removal, or just better aggro, is a factor now. That being said, Katakuri as a deck has the gimmick of just winning games if you're lucky enough. Katakuri also builds into other decks in the future, such as Purple Yellow Pudding. Not to mention, Katakuri is also getting a new structure deck, so this deck is sticking around in some form for a while. 
Green Yellow Yamato is mostly an aggro deck, with a leader that has double strike. The leader itself is the main driver of this deck, with other characters being bonuses and finishers. Recently, this deck has started to use the You Can Be My Samurai and Wano engine to draw more cards and set up for crazy combos, enabling insane consistency and the actual ability to play for late game. This build is a bit more expensive, but I really do recommend it. Yamato as a deck has always had the problem of getting counterpicked or counterplayed. Some decks and hands will just beat this strategy. That being said, this is a great deck that can do a lot for a new player who wants to play more aggressively. It's also very fun. Purple Monkey D. Luffy is a purple deck for purple decks. And by that, I mean its basic premise is to quickly ramp Dawn and then just spam purple staples. Of course, this is strong because it means late game is now mid game and you have some crazy finishers. This deck is often criticized for being very straightforward and really that's its only downside. That being said, I do think it's still quite fun and perfect for a new player. It's slightly expensive needing purple staples, but recent reprints have dropped this deck's price, so it should be affordable, hopefully. Later on, it's getting a new starter deck with new support, so it will remain somewhat relevant in the future. It also does build into other purple decks. Green Uda is a film deck all about spamming value and building large boards. Since this deck is roughly 95% film cards, your leader is just an extra draw every turn. Add in Nami and New Genesis, and you have titanic hand sizes. You might notice that this deck runs a ton of blockers. That's because this deck's obnoxious win con. Use this Captain Kid. Kid is a wall that this deck can very easily protect, thus locking our opponents into a loss. This deck is more expensive than it ought to be for a starter deck deck, but I really do think that this deck is perfect for a new player. It's straightforward enough, but it has so much room for a player to learn with. Thus, it justifies my recommendation for new players, despite the price. Here's a section of decks for those looking to try something new. These decks are of mixed quality, but are all decks that I personally love and think can be quite strong in the hands of the right player. Several of these are covered on the channel as full deck profiles, so check those out if you want more. Pure Yellow Big Mom is often considered to just be a worse version of Katakuri, and in many ways, this is true. However, by letting us stack our life directly and consistently, we open ourselves up to doing one thing absurdly well. Cheese. Imagine, if you will, consistently using multiple copies of the card Soul Pocus to just annihilate our opponent's life. Imagine stacking you're the one who should disappear consistently to the bottom life. Imagine consistently abusing every powerful trigger in this game. Our opponent is practically forced to stall us. Even still, we can just go late game. This is a surprisingly solid strategy that Bandai keeps releasing dumb support for. I really, do, I really recommend this deck if you're looking for playing the more fun and wacky parts of yellow. There's a ton of different gimmicks you can do with this leader. Zoro and Sanji are a weird forgotten about starter deck leader which is a shame because their mechanics are insanely fun and encourage creative deck building. Zoro and Sanji let you return a character with a cost of two or more to hand to restand a character you control with 7k attack or less. This lets you reuse on play effects in 2k's and even potentially combo with on attack effects activating twice. But it is important to understand why this leader never took off. The best effects and combos this deck can do aren't on play and therefore lose to removal so it's really not great in the current meta. The good news is, there is a build to mitigate that. By abusing the Warlord engine, we can throw out massive board and get on play effects easily. Thus, we get to use the powerful green Warlords alongside the blue cards, which is actually insane. It's a solid rogue version of this unfortunately forgotten about deck. Purple Yellow Crocodile is a stall late game leader. This deck's main gimmick is to ramp on the opponent's turn into massively strong late game. You heal an absurd amount thanks to 8-drop Crocodile, Ace, and Katakuri. Making this more spicy is the card will come my way, which lets us redirect an attack to any of our characters, hopefully Kikunojo. We stall absurdly well and can even outgrind decks like Enel and Bonnie. The downside is that consistency is a bit of an issue. We really want to see both Miss Wednesday, our best ramp option, and 8-drop Crocodile, our best heal option. The deck is also way more expensive than it needs to be, needing 12 different meta secret rares and still other expensive staples. All that for mid. Still, this deck is very fun to play. Well, not for the opponent. Kairos is a black-yellow leader. That's 90% of his power right there. 
Yellow and black staples are absurdly powerful together. Gecko Moria, recurring Kikunojo, and Viola Blocker is nuts. Follow that up with a 10 drop ace, and an opponent just loses for free. Kairos has built in removal on his leader skill. It's a bit restrictive, needing zero cost units, but if we deck build optimally, we can use it to win mid game for free. Removing 2 to 3, 4, or 5 drops a game is very strong. It all adds together to make a deck that can just high roll skilled opponents and just bullies anyone who's not prepared or still learning. It does have some bad matchups against the two best decks, but it does very well into other decks. Also, of course, Kairos is expensive. I'm going to be doing a full deck profile for Kairos either next video or the video after that, so please subscribe to see it. I've already made the spreadsheet. Red Green Kazuki Odin is the best land of mono deck right now. The deck does three main things. It has a leader with 6k base and 7k swings, it throws out a strong board of high power units very quickly, and it always has counter in hand. This means a good player can leverage these options to nuke an opponent. This deck has an especially good matchup into the best deck in the game, Trafalgar Law. As you mess with their dawn management, and really only play units that are too big for them to deal with efficiently. And as we all know, efficiency is what defines the best meta deck in the game. Take that away and they have nothing. This deck does have some consistency issues, really needing to see the card Kazuki Hiyori to enable its plays on curve. In my testing for a deck profile, I found that not seeing Hiyori drops the deck's win rate about 30%. Great game design, Bandai. That being said, it's still an immensely fun deck and the best of the Wano options right now. I love Kinemon, but Odin is the way to go at the moment. Foxy is a stun counterpick purple deck. Foxy lets us stun an opponent's leader and unit if we control three or more Foxy pirates. This leaves the deck in a very weird place. On one hand, this deck just kind of auto wins some matchups. If a deck depends on leader swing, it's not going to have a good time here. On the other hand, needing to stick three units on board is not great against the removal based meta, and having genuinely absurd ramp doesn't really fix the issue. So Foxy is kind of left in a state of limbo for what to do. The good news is, he's still immensely fun and his options that just mildly inconvenience an opponent are extremely funny. He also has a broken defensive card. I'd say that this leader is likely to get solid support in the next extra booster, so hopefully it'll get fleshed out there, because it really just needs a better top end and maybe another board spamming option. Eustace Captain Kid is a great aggressive rush option. This deck trades Trafalgar Law's removal for higher numbers and extra life padding. It might seem bad at first, but this leader lets us leverage insane pressure on an opponent. Kitten Killer, Rush Luffy, and even Monkey D Dragon are crazy. Or we can just set up for massive pressure with high attack heat, battery Captain Kid, and high numbers Captain Kid. This deck has an insane matchup into Black Yellow Luffy. The deck is good, but it depends on how well you can read your opponent, and how okay you are making those stressful I either win here or I lose calls. You really can't do half measures with Kid. Good news is, this deck is relatively cheap. So if you want a deck from the three captains, but don't like selling your liver, I really recommend Kid. That's everything for this run of how to choose a deck for One Piece. I've got more One Piece content coming up, and some massive Yu-Gi-Oh content coming up as well. So please subscribe if you want more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.